My name is John Lee Klein Jr. I'm from Detroit, Michigan. Today we're going to discuss drugs, what they are and what they can do to you. This is a subject that I can speak to you from personal experience. I was a, a member of the Harlem Globe Trotters from 1953 to 1959. Alcohol, nicotine, marijuana, crack, cocaine, heroin, all of the drugs that I have just mentioned can hurt your body. And if you abuse them enough, they can kill you. I know because they almost killed me. Because I was jumping all the time, they, they called me Jumping Johnny Klein. Johnny Klein was born in Detroit, Michigan on November 18, 1931. The Motor City was growing doubling in population over the previous 10 years to over one and a half million people. Automobiles were the most profitable export, though sales had declined due to the lingering American Depression. The sale of illegal alcohol was also profitable. It soaked the streets outside the city's 25,000 speakeasies during Prohibition. The sports landscape was vastly different during this era. The Detroit Lions hadn't yet made it to the Motor City, as they were still playing in Ohio as the Portsmouth Spartans. The Tigers had a dismal 61-93 and record in baseball's American League. The St. Louis Cardinals had recently defeated Connie Mack's Philadelphia Athletics in a rematch of the previous World Series. Detroit's pro hockey team, the Falcons, were in their fifth season. It wouldn't be until the following year they changed their names to the Red Wings and the United States' first professional basketball league, the American Basketball League, had recently folded shortly after crowning the Brooklyn Visitations champions. Around this same time in nearby Chicago, a young man named Abe Saperstein was building something that would change the course of young John Klein Jr.'s life. He was fielding a basketball team that would become known as the Harlem Globetrotters. Basketball is the most popular spectator sport in the nation. It's a game that calls for quickness, accuracy, and most important of all, teamwork. The collegiate brand has produced far too many stars to name here. But in the professional ranks, there's one team that's particularly outstanding, the Harlem Globetrotters. This unique organization, composed of some of basketball's most practiced performers, has lived up to its name. They've toured to the far corners of the world, and amused millions with their unbelievable brand of ball handling. The Globetrotters are an iconic cultural institution. I grew up with the Globetrotters. I've got a soft spot in my heart for the Trotters. I remember as a young kid, my grandfather told me, said, Michael, if you keep practicing that basketball the way you do, you can be as good as Goose Tatum and be a Harlem Globetrotter one day. The first time that I ever watched a basketball game on TV, I was probably like 12 years old. It was like a combination of athleticism, uh, artistry, and a uh, circus. Well, the thing that stuck with me most about these were some very talented athletes. You know, they, they were very good athletes. It's magical. It's really hard to put into words, uh, you know, just seeing a ball spin on someone's finger. I didn't know that this was the Harlem Globetrotters or who they were. I just knew that, wow, they're fun. I hope they win, you know? The Globetrotters was like uh, mythical figures that we saw on TV. Because they were universally popular, it would take people's minds off of some of the other things that were going on. There was a lot of other things that they did outside of just playing basketball that made them very popular. ABC would have the wide world of sports and you remember that sweet Georgia Brown, you'd hear that refrain and then you would always know that you, you would be entertained for a while. But back in those days, the Globetrotters were a much bigger draw because the NBA was considered a minor league in the eyes of a lot of people. The NBA is an international game now, but before it was an international game, there was the Harlem Globetrotters. Owners of arenas would use Globetrotter dates to boost their profits because they'd get a sellout for the Globetrotters and then half the people might leave when the, when the actual NBA game uh, began. So it was a way of helping keep a lot of clubs afloat. And they played the packed houses and, 
and they spread good cheer. And if there were no Harlem Globetrotters, I don't know if the NBA as it exists now uh, would be quite the same. And the, the main thing that I got from it was the crowd and t participation and how they brought so much joy to the kids. You know, the kids love them and not only the kids, the adults. So what, what I took from Globetrotters is just, you know, they made everybody happy and they included everybody. You know, it was a participation sport with the Globetrotters. You couldn't just sit there. So even today you hear Sweet Georgia Brown and it takes you right back. It, it's it's entertainment. It's fun. Uh, it's excitement. There's a allure to what the Globetrotters do. Over the course of nine decades, the Harlem Globetrotters have dazzled and delighted over 140 million fans on six continents in 122 countries. The Globetrotters are a who's who of basketball royalty. Meadowlark Lemon, Goose Tatum, Curly Neal, Marcus Haynes, and Will Chamberlain are among the legendary names that fill their rosters. The Globetrotters are considered by many the most famed franchise in the history of the sport of basketball, with a winning record second to none. No stranger to Hollywood, the team has starred in film and television projects from 1954's Go Man Go, starring Sidney Poitier, to television shows like Gilligan's Island, Scooby-Doo, and Futurama. But the Globetrotters didn't start out in Harlem. It all began on a playground on the south side of Chicago in 1926, when a group of young black athletes from Wendell Phillips High School met up with an ambitious young promoter from the north side named Abe Saperstein. Saperstein, a short Jewish man, saw an opportunity to draw a crowd with his local playground legends. The team was booked to play at the newly opened dance hall, the Savoy Ballroom, whose owners were looking to branch out from nightly jazz ensembles to a weekly basketball match. The team was rebranded, the Savoy Big Five, and in no time they were drawing big crowds in the Windy City. The Big Five played basketball straight without any of the antics the Globetrotters would become famous for. But with the Savoy Ballroom only booking basketball two nights a week, Saperstein saw an opportunity to reach a larger audience. He would send his all-black basketball team on the road to play exhibition matches against all comers in a barnstorming tour. The day of the barnstormer had come. You saw them at county fairs. They landed in pastures, took a few of the daring for a ride, and moved on. Barnstorming, a term held over from early airplane pilots who toured the countryside doing death-defying tricks, including flying through open barn doors. Barnstorming became a mainstay for unlikely sports teams. Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig toured to raise money for charity. The all-Jewish, all-bearded House of David toured with basketball and baseball teams. At a time when black players were kept out of the major leagues, barnstorming provided exposure for countless Negro League teams and the Globetrotters, who even played a little baseball when they couldn't book a basketball game. But Saperstein needed a name that would entice audiences, so he chose to call his team Globetrotters, to give the impression they had traveled the world. And his Chicago-based team would play under the name of a city they had never stepped into, Harlem, New York. Harlem, land of swing and jive, where the world learns how to sing and dance. In the early days, professional basketball really meant barnstorming. Yeah. Okay, it wasn't like there was a league. I think the leagues didn't come into, into existence until the mid-20s. Barnstorming became the only alternative for most black basketball players who wanted to be professionals. Um, Gold Drive started in 1927. They weren't playing comedian ball. They were playing to win. All of us played on the card with the NBA. See, a lot of people know, didn't, don't know that we played to keep the NBA alive back in the 50s. In 1940, they were the second world champions uh, in the Chicago uh, World Championship Tournament. Okay. So they, and that was nothing com com comic like going on at that during that time. The Globetrotters used to, it, at that point, enlisted some of the best uh, black athletes and players uh, in the world. It's interesting to note that these basketball teams of African Americans, and as noted by my colleague from Illinois, men and women, 
started as early as the 1920s. Might I remind my colleagues that it was not too long into the 1920s or before the 1920s that America was strangled by Jim Crow laws, uh, defined separatism by blacks and whites, uh, terror in the Deep South. And so for these teams to spring up, call themselves barnstorming, and uh, go about creating joy but also competition is a tribute that should be acknowledged. The fact that they played for 27 years without recognition and in discriminatory times should be acknowledged. I grew up in the Jim Crow era. Okay. I mean, you understand what's going on and then you don't understand what's going on. As, as a kid, uh, for instance, I didn't realize until many years later that the reason that I could see the Globetrotters at the Coliseum when we saw them is because that was one of the few days when they would allow uh, all access seating for blacks. Well, the thing is, you just notice the, 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 way, the way they're treated differently. You know, I could walk into a store and be treated differently from another black man that walks into the store, he won't get the same treatment. It's because they know they've seen my face or they've seen our face. And you know, we, we get a different treatment, which is, which is not right, but that's, that's the way the world is. For that day, all right, it allowed kind of a, a unity in terms of everybody enjoyed the glow cards. It took me a long time to actually understand that later. We had our own world, okay, that was totally apart from the white world. And we had our own uh, heroes and such and such and such. But what the Globetrotters were is that they were heroes in both worlds. I mean, they're heroes in the white world, they're heroes in the black world. You know, I think the, the Globetrotters endure because they're fun. Uh, it's for the sheer joy of playing the game of basketball. And as far as goodwill through the game of basketball, it, it, it started with the Harlem Globetrotters more than 90 years ago. I met Johnny Cohen, who was my best friend. I was, uh, I think I was eight years old. I've asked Ernie Wagner to join us today. Ernie Wagner uh, is a former Harlem Globetrotter. He played with the Harlem Globetrotters from 1954 to 1967. Uh, Ernie Wagner also played, you know, we all played together. Uh, at Wayne State University had some pretty good teams there. Uh, but Ernie Wagner is one of the most fundamentally sound basketball players I've ever seen. But, but Haston, where me and Johnny came up, was up, we called it uptown. And downtown was anything past Forest and Haston. And that went all the way down to the, the river. And Haston Street, we called it, as we grow up, the street of dreams. But my mother was, she was a very nice person, Roosevelt Jackson. And when she married my, my dad, my real father, well, his name was John Klein Sr. Then eventually later on she married James Covard. And James Covard had a large family. But Johnny had, he had Freddie, he had Gene, another brother. He had a brother named Gerald. And then eventually he had a brother named Ronald. Five brothers and one sister. But we all stuck together and we all played sports. Sports was our whole life. For As we grow up, we started getting interested in, you know, branching out in the girls. Family life was always great. We'd go to a lot of picnics. I never lived with my mother, but a short period of time. I lived with my aunt most of the time. She and her husband, my uncle Charlie, he was Chinese. We'd go to a lot of picnics. And there was a lot of picnic area around the Detroit, around Detroit. So we'd have a lot of fun. We'd have baseball games among the family. I started out jumping as, at an early age. Clarence was special with the jump. He was definitely that. My friends and I, we would, we would string an uh, automobile in a tube between two trees. But we used to get in the backyard because our parents didn't want us out of the backyard. And we had, he had, we had an old couch where we could land on, and we would put in a tube between the tree, and this is how he packed. And I used to do a lot of high jumping, jumping over those, and we'd raise it up from time to time. But we always used to talk about the playground right across the street from us. We called that the major leagues, because we could go on the playground and play with all the big guys. 
And then when we started being able to go on the playground, this when we met Gus Finney. And he was the, found out he was an ex-globe child of himself. So he was like our dad, you know. He's a, he was a former globe trotter, played in the 1930s. And Mr. Finney and them would have dances so that they could socialize and with the girls, knowing how to treat her, how to talk to her. He would be observing all that. And he was, you know, he gave us things that we, he figured we would need out in the world. Um, my name is Sharon Hill. I'm the daughter of John Klein and Dorothy Daniels. They met in high school. I knew Dorothy before Klein did. Oh, she was a nice looking girl. She could sing. Dorothy and them would come around to the study hall in high school and sing. That's when I found out about her. And I think I introduced Johnny to, to Dorothy. My mother was considered probably, uh, at that time, according to my dad, you know, one of the, the most beautiful women in the school. They started dating in high school. My mother had an amazing voice. When she was young, she actually um, won some contests, and she had a manager at one point. She never pursued that. I mean, she even knew Barry Gordy because he grew up in her neighborhood. My dad knew him, and she was friends with his sister. And he kept asking her, you know, when are you going to come down? When are you going to come down? Because, you know, she had done things in the, in the neighborhood, you know. And so she, she said, the story goes, she finally did go down there. And she, you know, they do have, they had everything downstairs. So she was walking down the stairs. She said she passed Marvin Gaye. He was really nice. But she got down there. She said, she said, I smell that reefer. <laughs> I came on back up. And that was the end of that. See, Johnny was playing down the Brewster Center and I was still in high school. And that's where the best ball players was at the time. Where we played Brewster Center was downtown. That was a real recreation facility, you know. But Sunday was a real, a real special day, man. The Brewster League, it's the story of itself because that's all we had. Church on Sunday, unless you had some money to take a girl to church. But everybody would go to, if they went to church, or they were definitely coming through Bruce because games ran from one o'clock in the day to maybe nine at night. Bruce was a, a community center that had a league that they played on every Sunday. That all the best basketball players in the city played down there on different teams. And it was a special place because uh, you would see everybody there, you know, older, younger people that like basketball. The, the first year I played with, with uh, the Pride of Michigan, which was a team that had won the championship in that league, uh, I think a couple years earlier. We played, our team played in the first uh, Motor City tournament, and we won that tournament. Beat Duquesne, everybody was surprised at, because Duquesne had a heck of a good team. And, and I was selected as the most valuable player in the tournament. These cafeteria where people, black people couldn't go in there. They couldn't go in there. They couldn't go in there and eat. But when we, we beat Duquesne, they opened the doors down there. People on Woodward Street in Detroit, they were walking down the street and they walked by the big picture window. They would look and then see us. They double check and come back because they couldn't, you know, didn't believe it. But we, we were the first ones they didn't. Know. I had uh, still had that jumping thing in me. I couldn't get it. I was always jumping. I never stopped jumping since the time I was mentioned to you. I was in the backyard of my house. Well, Jack Jack Cotton was the the. I think he was the football coach at the time. He was in recreation. He told me with a guy named Cotton. The guy was a coach, football coach. But he was about winning, you know. He's the guy who was, was doing the moonlighting with coaching basketball. And so he's the one that recommended that I go over and see uh, the coach of Wayne University at the time, Joel Mason. He, the guy who had played football for the Green Bay Packers. And so I went over to Wayne University and Joel was in his cage uh, refereeing some, some of the scrimmages that were going on with, with his previous team. So I told him that, that Jack Cotton had sent me over. He said, well, go in the locker room, change your clothes, and come on back out and 
let's see you work out. I played with Charlie Primus and Johnny Kahn at Wayne University, 1950 to 53. Oh, Mason was, now I always say he was a good coach at management. He told me one day, he said, you know what, I treat you one way, and I treat Charlie one way, and I treat Klein one way. And, and then when I didn't understand at first what he was talking about personality-wise, Mason then was getting some scholarships over there for football, you know, basketball. And, and, and that's, that's the whole thing. You know, you had Detroit on the move. Like Mr. Finney used to tell us, you guys should, you, Charlie, and Klein should run, y'all should own Detroit. Detroit is the center of a great sports community in central United States. So I like the way you play. And uh, we can give you a scholarship and a tuition and, and a little job working 20 hours a week, maybe about a dollar thirty, dollar forty cent an hour. And so I was, of course, overjoyed to hear that. Typical of Detroit's many institutions of higher education, the vigorously growing campus of Wayne State University. Like other colleges and schools in the metropolitan area, its modern architecture is creating a new image of beauty and function. But when I got to Wayne, the coach name was uh, Coach Holmes. He was pretty well known coach for track nationally for that time, during that time. Because he had sent Wayne University teams, track teams to the Olympics. He asked, could I, did I think I could come out for the track team? And I told him, I said, I don't know. That's, I, I, I'm on scholarship to play basketball here. I don't know if I could, what I could do with the track team. So he said, well, is it okay if I talk to your coach and see if I could get him to let you, allow you to work out with the track team? Yeah, I enjoyed the track because it gave me an opportunity to travel around the country. At Wayne State, he was an All-American. Uh, a guy that, that was, uh, you know, sort of like Jackie Robinson himself or, or Jim Thorpe, uh, these great athletes who could be an entire track team by themselves because they were good enough to high jump and long jump and throw the shot put. Jackie Robinson. He was the first Negro to play Major League Baseball. An aggressive competitor, he asked no quarter and gave none. But he won the admiration of players and Eventually fans. Eventually they had the regional Olympics there in Ann Arbor at the University of Michigan. And I placed in all three of my events, which gave me an opportunity to go to, to uh, the College to see him in LA, Los Angeles, to partic participate in the final trials. And I placed in the high, the high jump, the, high, the broad jump, and the triple jump. It's not well known, but he went out and, and uh, tried out for the US Olympic team. And you know, he was a high jumper, a broad jumper, uh, obviously, the kids say now he had mad hops. If the opportunities for track and field had been as extensive then as they are now, he might have done that instead of the basketball because he said he really enjoyed uh, competing as a high jumper. And I had broken all the uh, high jump records at Wayne University, six, seven, six, seven, indoor and outdoor records. And then I was just breaking records. Every, almost at every track meet I'd go to, I'd break a record, of, a tire record. During his time, he got them into mainstream press, and uh, he got himself uh, in the mainstream press, too. It's unfortunate that he didn't get to finish his career, his playing career at Wayne State. I played three years at Wayne. I became academically ineligible. I, I guess I just got to the point where, you know, the classes started 
beating down on me, you know. Gus Finney called me and he said, Johnny, now that you can't play anymore at the university, what are you going to do? So I said, well, I don't know, I hadn't planned anything beyond that, coach. He said, how would you like to have a trial with the Harlem Globetrotters? Johnny Klein was a powerhouse for the Harlem Globetrotters. It doesn't surprise me that Dr. Klein gravitated toward the Trotters and, and had such an exemplary career with the Trotters. You know, and you're talking about some legends, Meadowlark Lemon, Curly Neal, people like that, Wilt Chamberlain. I got involved with the Globetrotters. We had to, I had to go to Chicago, and you had to, you had to compete for different slots on the, on the organization's roster. When I got there, they had a hundred guys. A hundred guys and they kept 10. I got an opportunity to uh, try out for the Harlem Globetrotters in 1986. Along with 1,500 other players, I was selected as one of the top players. The owner, Abe Sabastine, made me an offer, I think it was four or five hundred dollars a month, something like that, for, to play with the team. So I'm thinking, I'm, I'm working two days a week in Detroit and in, in Michigan, and I'm making more money than that. Why should I, why should I make less money and play with the Harlem Globetrotters? But the guy who sent me to Chicago was Gus Finney. When I came back from Chicago, and he said, well, how do you like it? What are you gonna do? I said, well, I just don't like the money. He said, well, why don't you try it for a year? And if you like it, you know, you stay. And if you don't, you, you know, Come back and do what you want to do. Benched by the books, but still wanting to play basketball, John Klein joined the Globetrotters in 1953. Soon after, he'd be followed by his childhood friend, Ernie Wagner, as well as Wayne University's other standout cage star, Charlie Primus. The big three, as they'd been dubbed by the Detroit press, were reunited as Globetrotters. When I got there, the, my first year, there was a guy from Anderson College in Indiana named Jumpin' Johnny Wilson. They had a guy named Jumpin' Johnny something. They took that name away and gave it to Klein, Jumpin' Johnny Klein. I told him, I said, Johnny, I'm afraid you're going to have to lose that title of Jumpin' Johnny now that I'm here. You know, and he laughed, we laughed about it, but because everybody was, I was out rebounding him and everybody else on the team, but. I used to love to rebound. And uh, I found that there were a lot of players who tried to block me out, couldn't do that very effectively. I read uh, a little bit of, about Dr. Klein, and, uh, that, that he was such a great athlete, such a great jumper, that he could out-rebound all these tall people, and Wilt was 7'1". And, and I thought, wow, I, I'm going to have to look that up. If Dr. Klein could hang with this guy on the boards, uh, that's really something. But could nobody hang as high as he could? It couldn't stay up there like that. But Michael Jordan ain't doing nothing. Clan couldn't do. <laughs> I had an opportunity to travel overseas and, and throughout different places around the, the, the world. Uh, once you become a globetrotter, you are exposed to so many different people. Uh, people who are high celebrities. You might meet the Pope. Uh, I met Mother Teresa, several presidents. And then I go somewhere like India and I meet a whole group of people who may not even haven't eaten in a couple of days. I mean, he met he met the queen when she was being coronated. I think being able to see so much and and experience so much, so it just it changes the uh, the channels in in your brain or something. You know, I don't, I don't know. I I've, I've never really seen anything like him. I don't think in terms of the, of that. I first joined the Harlem Globetrotter basketball team myself in 1953, and I played until 1959. I traveled throughout the Far East, some parts of the Middle East, Central and South America, Australia, New Zealand. I remember the first year we went to Australia, in 1953, my first year, we played, I think it was eight games in three days. See, me and Johnny, we played together, but we didn't stay together out there on the same day. This was probably Abe's deal, you know, because he caught me and Johnny over there in our street one day, night, me and him hanging out, walking down the street with a couple of girls, trying to talk, you know, talk to them. 
And they didn't like that, man. They didn't like it. Abe didn't like it. So he called a meeting about the Globetrot meeting. You guys know the situation over here. A lot of things they don't like. So when he got through talking, Salisbury got up and said, look here, Skip. Some of the guys called Skip. He said, they ain't got no black women over here. What you think we going to go out with? And man, I said, oh, they ain't get ready to send everybody home now. We carried a team with us called the Boston Whirlwinds. Some of these guys were all Americans. Now, I understood that, uh, you know, guys take pride in what they do in their game, developing their game and become as good as they could. They had to be humiliated by us, you know, because we would put the show on them, you know. You know, I thought I put myself in their shoes. And I said, now, nah, I don't know whether I could sit there and, and let this happen to me night after night. Almost all the teams I ever played on, I was the leading rebounder. See, we had three teams that year. The, North, the, the, the Western team, the Eastern team, and the Southern team. The Eastern team, of course, was uh, the team, they, they just played all the major cities. Chicago, New York, LA, and you know, cities like that. Now, Klein, by him being out there, he was with the Southern unit. So they were down south way more than we was. You are going south. So they had to take a team called the Kansas City Stars with them because, you know, they didn't let like black teams play against white teams during that time. So that's why we carried the Kansas City Stars along with us, just in case we couldn't uh, arrange to play against local white teams. I ended up playing with the with the uh, Kansas City Stars, which was the, sort of like the farm team to the Gold Trotters. You know, we play every night, every night for throughout the entire year, just about. It was very similar to what Major League Baseball was in the pre-Jackie Robinson era. It was a heavily white league. There were only a handful of black players. I didn't realize that for a long time they only had three black guys in the NBA. Back then, and that was uh, Charlie Cooper, Earl Lloyd, and uh, Sweetwater Clifton. Well, the guys that came before me, such as uh, Dr. John Klein and Meadowlark Lemon and Curly Neal and Tex Harrison, they had a little rougher time of being a globetrotter, of dealing with the social issues, although they had it better than other African Americans. You know, most of the time we slept on the bus. We couldn't eat or we couldn't go to bed in the same city that we played the game in. Couldn't eat in a restaurant or a hotel, nothing like that. We had to drive, we maybe stop at a Safeway, one of those markets, and, and get some sandwiches and some, and some pop. It's a very similar story to what Jackie Robinson endured when he, when he broke the color barrier in baseball. Uh, you, using the N-word and things like that, it, it just made me sick. And, to realize what what uh, Jackie must have gone through, and, and Jumpin' Johnny Klein had to do the same thing. When we played out in the South, we had to play, white people sometimes sit on one side of the floor and black on the other. Sometimes we played before the white people uh, at night and the black people in the day. Yeah, we did it, and it didn't feel, I didn't like all that. Man. But they knew that we wasn't being treated right, impersonating some shit that ain't even right here. And the players who broke the color line there really suffered a lot. They, they would go to these games, and uh, the referees, uh, other teams would follow them, and the referees would turn their backs, look the other way. Of course, they couldn't stay in the same hotels, eat in the same restaurants as their teammates, but it sort of brought these teams together. It was sort of an us against them mentality. And uh, I think they, they drew strength from the, the, the struggles that they endured as they broke the color lines. But thank goodness for, for those kind of pioneers like Dr. Klein, because now I think the game has become so universal. I, I remember one night we was in Idaho and we went to this restaurant and they opened the door, but they wouldn't let us in. So Mr. Welch, we got to a phone and he made a call to the promoters, you know, and told them what was going on. And then they wanted to accept us and told us to come on back. They let us in. And we told them we don't want to go back. But down south all the way, 
I, I, I didn't particularly like to go, like Louisiana. Our bus driver, we weren't going to stay there after we played, so he going he gonna to gas up. So they asked the guy, said, do y'all have any pies in there? And he said, yeah, we got some pies in there. So we said, we get off the bus. So he was going back in to get Hickey Red, that's what we call our bus right? get him a ticket, you know, a bill. So the guy looked up and seen us in there. He said, what you guys want? We said, we want some pies. He said, you can't get no pies. You got to go around the back. And what did he say that for? Buckhole, he about six eight. <laughs> Carl by <about> six five. <laughs> And they are out of New York and out of Chicago. They went to Cussin. I had to almost drag him out of there. I said, man, don't y'all know where we were at down here? And he went to call him Pete, Red, Joe. And man, you talking about it. I said, man, come on. All night long when we playing, I'm watching the front door. I said, they're going to come in and kick the hell out of us, you know? And I think that's what these early pioneers did. They had character and they had heart and they endured. And now the game is so much better as a result. This is after Abe Sapstein had taken over his team. So then he was, he was arranged to give people a little bit additional money. So uh, we'd make, when we played those additional games, we'd make a little more money. Abe was more about drawing people, man. He, if he come to a place, okay guys, showtime. You know, I could get on, I could dribble. I do the dribble and Klein do the little trick with the ball. When the Globetrotters come out on the court, when as soon as they surface in between all the crowds of people, they, they form a magic, what they call a magic circle. The magic circle is one of the Harlem Globetrotters fame routine and everybody don't get into the circle at the beginning. And there may be five or six guys in that circle, one, two, three, four, five, six. And each one of them is doing separate, different types of tricks. You know, they're only gonna take the best five ball handlers. Matter of fact, it took a couple of years for me to even make it to the magic circle. And uh, I had to take that basketball to my hotel room every night. I broke plenty of lamps uh, practicing. The last guy does the trick and he passes off to the main man, and he takes a shot, takes a shot. They run this weave, the three-man weave, for a reason. Because that puts everybody into the game and leave one side open where you can do tricks. And there are some Globetrotter uh, routines that are people are looking for, such as the bucket. One of the tricks is, of course, uh, a bucket of confetti. But you don't know if it's going to be water or confetti. And so that's part of the mystique of the Globetrotters. You just don't know and you're always wondering what is next. To get the people to think that there's water in that, in that bucket. So when they come around, everybody's getting out the way and then they pour the water, so suppose the water uh, on a certain crowd, a certain location. And it's actually, it's just a confetti. Some things I can't tell. Some things are globetrotter secret and I can't tell. If a guy is a, is a heckler, for example, especially in the South, they would call us real different, bad names, different names, referring to us as monkeys or whatever. This heckler may be drinking some beer or some pop or something. He, he wouldn't, be, wouldn't be paying too much attention. They would sit up in front of this heckler, right? And the picture would would throw the ball, throw the basketball, and the catcher would duck it in the basketball, would hit the guy in the face, and the beard would jump all, come all over him, pop or whatever it was, popcorn, and things like that. They would do tricks like that. In these little rural towns, and you know, you could just feel that it was a totally different environment, you know. <laughs> so, so you didn't, you, you just kind of, you didn't, you didn't venture too far from the from the from the main road or or the main path because you knew that the racism was still out there. It's like time stood still in some of these towns. We've got some troubles in this country. There's no question about it. But I think uh, we grow, we're growing up in an era, our, our kids are growing up where people are more tolerant and they don't see color so much as they see character. I always try to teach my, my kids that, you know, don't judge a, a man by the color of his skin. 
Judge, judge him by, by, by his heart and his character. You know, we were like kids, we were like family. And that's why I look at a lot of these guys, you know, some of the guys would do certain things to each other, especially rookies, you know what I'm saying? And I was kidding somebody not long ago. I said, we used to get into the stadium sometime early. I remember when they did on me, they found one of them big old stuffed bears and they would find a bear, they didn't, they'd be for the mascot, you know, for the school. They rolled it up to the door and then they called me. And they said, well, hey, come here, I want you to see something. And man, I ran, I then ran into that, bowl, that polar bear on that the roller. I almost fainted in there. <laughs> you should have seen me, man. I think the, the excitement of playing with the Globetrotters to travel to Europe, South America, Far East, I mean, that, boy, that was really good living, you know what I mean? We're staying at the Raffles Hotel. At that time, the Raffles was supposed to have been the largest hotel in the world. Get up one morning and uh, come out, the sun was shining, it was a beautiful day. All right, they got these rickshaws lined up just like the taxis would be lined up outside the hotel, ready to take somebody wherever they wanted to go. These guys, they, you, know, they, you know, they run in these rickshaws, with these rickshaws, and they had, some, they had beautiful legs, you know. And these guys decided they wanted to race uh, two of us in a rickshaw. <laughs> and, and the rickshaw driver was running it down the street. And, and, the, and the rickshaw almost turned over. And I get up that morning, that morning, the next morning from, from the raffles, and we go outside. And there's a guy out there. You know how they used to build those flutes to get the snake to come up out of the basket? So this is the guy up there, we just going playing some kind of tune. Then when I talked to him, he said, uh, said where, you, where would you guys like to go? He thought we wanted to, to meet some, go where some females were. And he started talking about Ch Chinese female, Asian female, African female. Which, you know, which females you want to uh, go hook up with? Actually, he kind of uh, had a reputation as a ladies man too. Now, he didn't go in specifics, but he let you know that uh, he had had some good times uh, on the road when he was at the Globetrotters. We said we wanted to go and find some weed. Some, he said, you mean you want to smoke something? My partner said, yeah, yeah, we want to smoke something. He said, well, I, he said, I take you a place where, he said, I went in and I smoked on Monday, didn't wake up till, till Thursday. He said, he said, no, he said, we don't, want, <laughs> we don't want any of that. We'll pass on that one. But he was smoking opium, you know. After he told us Monday, Monday to Thursday, he said, no, not that one. We'll leave that one alone. What better life can you have to, to get up? Six months out of the year, you're traveling all over the world, meeting all kinds of wonderful people and traveling to places that it would cost you a, a fortune to go to if you had to pay for it yourself. I mean, it was just, for a young man under 30 years of age, it was just the, the place to be. One guy in Lima, Peru, for example, I didn't know this guy, but my friend Chico Burrell, who actually was my roommate, he had been to uh, South America before. He knew this cab driver. This cab driver came and picked us up. He was taking us to some apartment, and he picked up another girl, because he only had, he had one girl when he came to get us, and he, so he had to go find the other lady. And so he took me and Chico, took the two of us to this apartment where he had left a whole, a whole just a lot of food, a lot of alcohol, drank some, some smokes and, and things, because he was, he was addicted to something. I don't know if it was cocaine or heroin or what, but because when he was driving, he was skin popping. You know what skin popping is? Well, that means you, you know, you don't try to hit a vein, you just take the needle. Now he's driving, he's, he's riding in the taxi, he's driving the taxi and he's just hitting himself with the needle, you know. When you, when you use the shooting, you're trying to put it in a, in a vein so it goes through and gets to the heart and the head quicker. My understanding of it is that the bulk of I guess you say substance abuse problems or uh, personal conduct problems or however, however you choose to uh, define what you're into. I think the bulk of that came uh, 
in the early period after he wasn't playing basketball anymore. How do they start? They usually start out young, maybe on a dare, maybe to follow the crowd. Many begin with marijuana and the pattern of escape is established. They then graduate to the harder drugs, the addictive drugs for bigger kicks, and soon they are hooked. Five, ten, twenty dollars a day. How do they get the money? Narcotics breed a desperate race of men. See, Johnny, with the drugs, he got off into that before I did. Well, I started out, of course, smoking weed. Well, smoking cigarettes and then smoking weed. And then every once in a while, I'd run into some cocaine and, and start using that. Instead of smoking, they were still, they started snorting heroin. Just the idea of getting high was the thing. You know, it was significant that uh, you know, I, I enjoyed the feeling. And so I started hanging out with them and started snorting heroin. And later on, couldn't afford to keep snorting it because it cost more money to snort than it did to shoot it with the hypodermic needle. So I started using the hypodermic needle. From morphine comes heroin, outlawed even medically from the United States. These and other derivatives form the group of drugs called opiates. Opiates are classed as depressants. An overdose causes unconsciousness, then death. A smaller dose, taken into the bloodstream, inhibits all the functions of the body by its action on the brain and the central nervous system. But the body gradually builds up a tolerance to the drug. More and more is needed to produce the same effects. After continued use, the body acquires a physical dependence on opiates, so that withdrawal of the drug causes a brief but violent illness until the body can make a readjustment. But Kai and them didn't know. I mean, he stopped coming around me. He, he never was around me like that. And one thing led to another. And eventually I got busted by the police and sent to jail a couple of times, several times. And you know, when you have that kind of status and, and, and you're that well known, things come to you very easily. You know, you got people coming around, hey man, just because they want to be around you, they're going to give you these drugs and give you these things. Uh, it's, a, it's a real challenge because you want all these people around you, but you can't have the good without having the bad when they're around you. So I, I just think that, you know, the, the pressure of it and when I say pressure, we think of peer pressure, we think of just kids having peer pressure, but athletes have so much pressure on them as well that it, it's, it's almost unbelievable, man. You, you can't believe it because they're, they're pulled on this way, pulled on this way, everybody wants something from them, you know, and sometimes you don't have anything to give. You, you just don't. People get caught up in stuff and they look for escapes. And uh, for whatever reason, he felt pressurized and uh, alcohol and heroin became an escape, or, or, or a means to cope with whatever it was. Only he found out that the, all he was doing was making more problems. But he thought he was finding a way to cope with whatever it was he was dealing with at the time. So I don't think many of us really thought about playing with the NBA that much. I thought, if anything at all, it was just the, the fact that we, we might have been denied the opportunity just because we were black. In 1957, the Fort Wayne Pistons would move to Johnny Klein's hometown of Detroit. Growing weary of his time with the Trotters, Johnny attempted to break into the National Basketball Association, joining the Pistons for a tryout and appearing in a series of exhibition matches. Johnny made several cuts, with the coaches commenting to the media about his impressive ball handling. But ever the jumper, Klein was prone to out-rebound the competition. But he didn't shoot the ball as much as the coaching staff had hoped. His NBA dream now dashed. He rejoined the Barnstormers from Harlem for his final few seasons. My last year with the Globetrotters, I was a bunch of guys, and I, I, you know, different guys have been breaking away from the Globetrotters, forming their own teams. So, me, Three, three, four other guys and myself had decided that we, we were going to form our own team. And when Johnny left, I was feeling 
getting kind of bad because I really wanted to go too, you know. In the meantime, though, I'm still strung out on these drugs. And uh, so the team is comes through Detroit. They had about another three or four weeks, four weeks maybe, before the season was over. And they said, well, come on, join us. I said, no, man, can't you see I'm not in any condition to join you? I mean, I, I'm, I got this bad habit. It's all, you can get some methadone. The addicts were using to try to wean, them off, wean themselves off of the drug, heroin. But anyway, I, I agreed to do it. He would be high a lot of times, you know. And, you know, he wouldn't even take it easy on the fact that, that he had to play, you know. He'd be out there on the court I had. The first game I played up there, I, I thought I was going to die. I was so sick, I spent more time in the bathroom than I did on the basketball court, throwing up, up chucking and all that. And then after about four or five days, I started feeling a little better because I wasn't using anything. But I was still going through, probably had some of that withdrawal in my system. I was probably still going through that. In the spring of 1959, with his Globetrotters days behind him, Johnny headed towards New York City in an attempt to keep playing basketball with some of his former teammates on the Harlem Ambassadors and in the Eastern Pro League, which farmed out players to the NBA. During this time, he'd get to know his father, John Klein Sr., for the first time and participate in the Nation of Islam, studying under Malcolm X and Louis Farrakhan, then known as Louis X. Inspired by the teachings of the Quran, he began to ease his drug use. But his life would spiral out of control and into relapse with a tragic phone call that would ultimately end his professional basketball career and send him back home to Detroit. My aunt had raised me, and I was also trying to do a lot, a lot of things for her. I know that my, my dad was raised by his Aunt Ree, and I, I felt like he was spoiled by his Aunt Ree. And I used to call my aunt every day on my lunch break, see how she was doing, you know. So my sister told me that my aunt had fell, and she went upstairs and she had fell and they had to take to the hospital and then she passed, she had died. I came home to help the family with the uh, arrangements and support system. And some of the guys that I had been smoking with and drinking and hanging out with. Yeah, so I'm, I'm having all these different experiences now. You know, I'm getting strung out on drugs and the next thing you know, you, you're doing something that you never thought you'd do. When Klein got in his drug game, he went, you know, got to you and he went to New York. And he was doing some things I didn't know about. For one, it may take five shots, for another 50, but the narcotic will be master. After I got involved and got addicted with it, I had to, you know, I had to find out that I had to get money every day. If I didn't get the drug, I would go through a withdrawal. And the withdrawal was, was it was that pleasure pain thing. It was pleasure when you were high, but it was painful when you, when you going through withdrawal. Very painful. I got addicted to the lifestyle and the money. I wasn't addicted to drugs. I've been clean since 85. When I, you think I want to go back that way? You can have a pound of drugs right there. I respect it. I know what it'll make you do. It'll make you turn on your mama, your daddy. And then that meant that I had to get out there and do some things that I hadn't been accustomed to doing, stealing and, and uh, you know, doing some unusual things. Uh, but after my aunt, when my aunt passed, it's when that, all that happened. He had gotten way down, you know, doing, he was putting down, you know, sticking, probably sticking up some people. I came back and started hanging out with my old buddies who were doing new things, different, new and different things. He came back, like, and he used to test it, test the drugs and so forth for and guys in the street, they were riding me about him. Man, I seen him, he wasn't this, he looked like, I almost had to go to fight him, you know, because I'd be mad. Narcotics are a multi-million dollar business. 
An ounce of heroin costing $30 in Europe is worth $300 upon crossing the United States border. And then the profits really start. He recovered addiction. I had one guy that had worked his way up spending 100000 I made 34000 just off him. That's scary money for a black guy, man. All the money I made with AIDS, I ain't made no 34000 <laughs> I buried about 500000 one time in my dad's basement, digging and trying to put me. It became a job. Just trying to put stuff away, man, money. You know. And I went home, started back, same old nonsense again, messing around with drugs. And then a friend of mine I was running around with called me one night after I had been over there hustling with him on the other side of the city on 12th Street. He called me, he said, man, you need to hurry up and get back over here. All hell is broken loose. I said, what do you mean? He said that there's, there's a riot, a race riot go, taking place. So I said, a race riot? And in the meantime, I had a bunch of suits that I had come into possession of. And another guy named Bob White hadn't gotten over there in time to get much, so he, he heard that I had a lot of some clothes that I was trying to get rid of. The guy came by and asked me, could he sell some, sell some of those clothes for me? And you know, I gave him so much money for it. So I said, okay. And then I, didn't, I couldn't find Bob for the next three or four days. I was looking for him. And then when I found him, somebody said he was in the hospital. He had parked his car and, in back of a building to, in, to go in and get some drugs. When he came out, there was a guy out there angry, upset with him, and the guy shot him five times. But All I can do is tell my story and tell what I went through. Yeah. Because I thought once I got to the money, everything would be good. I don't care how much money you get, you don't seem to get enough. I didn't have enough. We was coming back on the expressway. And we had the half a key, I mean the three half a keys back in the back. And then all of a sudden, man, I hear the police coming. They got the lights on. I said, damn, I don't usually carry no gun, but I got a gun. That was the first thing that crossed my mind. You gonna have to kill that man. I said, oh, I'm gonna be in jail forever. I ain't gonna never get out of jail if they bust us here. And so by the time he get up, something else crossed the line and said, don't do that. Play it all the way out. And when the man get to the car, I give him a glow child car, old one. When the guy seen that, he, he kind of seen the glow child car. He said, where you guys coming from? I said, we coming from up east. We've been up there booking some dates. And he said, you know, you let us go, man. I was so happy. I think about that. I said, no God had to be watching over me. And really, if I got to go through that again in life to get to where I was, I wouldn't want to go that way no more. Suffering from his addiction and the legal problems from a life of crime to feed his habit, Johnny begins to feel he's hit rock bottom. His longtime friend Ernie Wagner tried to look out for him, but mounting problems of his own were on the horizon. Johnny found a life raft in his high school sweetheart and mother of his children, Dorothy. Throughout the years up until from, from the time they met, fell in love, um, divorced, and she moved on and he moved on, my dad was, like I told you, a constant in our lives. And that had to do with that love that never faded. And the fact that at times they were still together as a couple, um, they would get back together. and. That was several times. Um, and then other times, even if they weren't, she was still there for him. It would took me one night, his wife called me and asked me to come back. She asked me, she said, Wag, is you giving Johnny any money? I said, yeah, every night when we break down, me and my partner, Appleseed, she said, yeah, I look out. She said, he the only dope fiend. I know got a bank book. <laughs> but he had to buy no drugs. I, we, you know, we looked out for him when he was around. Then he kind of dissed, dissed, got away. Once I realized that I was uh, strung out, as they used to call it, addicted, my first wife and I had gotten back together. And we had, by this time, there were eight, there was seven to eight kids in the family. 
that we were trying to raise. Say if he was out and didn't have a place to go and he would come and live with us. Um, and there were things that we noticed, like he would be in the bathroom a long time or he would nod out sometimes or our bikes or the TVs would get pined. Well, my mother never said anything about any of that. She was there for him. He had, um, I think it was Grand Theft Auto and he was gonna, he was, uh, Grand Theft, and he was gonna send uh, him away uh, some serious time. And my mother went down there and she's just that personality. And she talked to the judge and convinced him not to, to send him to jail. When our dad was there, he was just our dad. And we loved and respected him and she wouldn't have it any other way. She never spoke anything against him. She never told us any of the issues that might've been going on between them or what was happening uh, with the drug situation. And even there were some relapses there uh, along the way until he got his life really what, what he considered straightened out. I tried to quit a bunch of different times, try to get off the drugs. I, I remember one time my wife and my best friend, one of my good friends, drove me all the way down to Lexington, Kentucky, because they had a, a federal prison down there where they, they had some kind of federal a drug rehabilitation program. The 1956 Narcotic Control Act spelled out the most severe and inflexible set of laws ever put on the federal books. At the same time the law was taking a harsher look at the addict, popular opinion began to swing back in his favor, recognizing that he was not just a criminal, but a sick person, a pathetic, tortured human being in need of help. The Narcotic Addict Rehabilitation Act of 1966 set forth a new national policy for treatment of addicts. At the core of the policy is the premise that addiction is an illness that should be treated, not a criminal act in itself. For the first time, federal law permitted addicts to apply for treatment instead of being prosecuted. At the Federal Narcotics Hospital in Lexington, Kentucky, Bars that had restrained addicts for 33 years were removed. Dramatic proof of society's new attitude toward the wretched victims of the opium poppy. It became a major drug abuse research center administered by the National Institute of Mental Health. My mom, had, uh, they had got together and got him in a treatment center in Kentucky. And um, so all we knew is that he was gone. And she said he'll be gone for a while, you know, and he'll be back. I got down there and it was during the Christmas season. My wife, she was so happy that I was try making a supreme effort to get off the drug. But uh, when I got down there, and I was there for a few days, maybe a week or so. And the program was supposed to be about 30 days. But And so we decided to sign ourselves out and uh, call the cab to the bus, Greyhound bus terminal took the Greyhound home to Detroit. One of the first things I did was try to find out who had the best drugs in the community at that time, because I, I wanted to get high again. So I went, found out that this guy, Paul, had, they said he had the best drugs. So we went, I went by his apartment and sit up there and got high and stayed up there for a while. And then I took a cab back to my house where my, my wife and my kids were staying. And like I said, it was Christmas time, and and uh, my wife. I looked in the window. My wife was was a. Uh, you know how you do when you make up the Christmas tree. You put the bells and the ornaments on. She was standing on a chair, and she saw me looking. She started crying because she knew it, another failed effort. The next thing I know, it was Christmas, and he he couldn't stay there. I guess he. He said he had to come home. So my mom said, well, your dad got back early because he wanted to be here with you guys for Christmas, but he left, you know, the center. So that was one of probably the many times that, you know, he had probably tried to, to, to kick it. And I don't care what nobody say. Everybody got to have somebody. But just like uh, Johnny, he was able to deal with it because he had got tired of it. You got to get tired of it. I think every person has to have that one person who, no matter what happens, they're there for them, they're gonna believe in them, um, 
And my mother was that person for my dad, even though they were not no longer together. And he throughout our lives at times, he, he stayed with us. But I always looked up to him because I didn't have a big brother. I always wanted a big brother, you know. He's very uh, forthright, very honest about his whole life, and he doesn't try to hide or sugarcoat anything. So His life shows you all of what, what sports can be, you know, the good, the bad, the ugly, and also the recovery of it all, too. You know, he went through all of that and still was able to, to lead a good life. I had been addicted for about eight, nine years on heroin and cocaine, and I went through all, all those series of different things, going back and forth to the local precinct, jail. And finally, you know, I was still trying to get, trying to work my way out of the, this addiction. And I was, uh, because I didn't, you know, my kids were growing up and I just didn't want to be, want them to see me going through that kind of life. I was 16 years old when I found out, and that was through reading the paper. He had recovered and they were, you know, he was getting all these accolades and honors. But then when I thought back, you know, and I think maybe my oldest brother, but because he and I were like, we helped my mother, you know, we were the ones she counted on a lot. He may have known or noticed and, but ne never spoke of it to us either. The National Institute of Mental Health had this program and they had 10 slots for some guys, some people in Detroit to go through this program and and do it at, at Lafayette Clinic. It's such a great story to tell uh, when, when he dealt with addiction. And back in the day when, when he fought it off and, and, and got it behind him, there weren't the sophisticated clinics that there are now. He just did it. They wanted me to start reducing the 10 milligrams a day, you know. I didn't want to do that. I wanted to do it differently. I wanted to do it my way, try to reduce 10 down to five to four, three, two, whatever, till I was completely off. After I got down to five milligrams, then uh, I realized I wasn't as sick as I had been, you know, with the withdrawal, early heavy doses of methadone. And so uh, I thought, I said, well, if I'm, I've been only taking five, I would just try five every other day. After the second and third day, I realized I hadn't had any, I hadn't had any methadone. So if I hadn't had any methadone, that means I didn't need, I didn't need the methadone. I wasn't getting sick. I wasn't going through withdrawal. From that point on, I just stopped using completely. Um, him being able to be around us still was part of what helped him to really finally make up his mind when he got to Lafayette Clinic that, you know, this is it. I, I got to get done with this. It's kind of a metamorphosis almost because there are some people who, if they had done the things that he did, they wouldn't have made that kind of change. I was feeling a whole lot better. Wasn't spending money for drugs. I was surprised I'd have money in my pocket because now I didn't, I didn't have to rush to spend that money every day for the drugs. So I decided to go back to school. I registered back at Wayne University. Yeah, in 1985, uh, I received my PhD in, in history and philosophy of education at Wayne State University. He had the presence of mind to go back and get his education. He got his master's degree. Then he got his doctorate's degree. And the rest of his life's work was spent doing similar to what he did with the Trotters. Uh, he was an ambassador of goodwill. He wanted to help people. Uh, he wanted to make people's lives better. I, I would like to do this and I'd like to give, set an example for others who may be struggling with the same kind of demons that I had been struggling with. To have overcome the things that he's uh, overcome, he's uh, a symbol to uh, many people. You know, my kids were growing up and I wanted to be some sort of a model for them. And, and also a support system. You know, I knew I, if I was out there hanging out, couldn't take care of myself, how was I gonna be a support system for somebody else? I can remember visiting once my dad uh, when he was in Lafayette Clinic and then I can remember coming to visit my dad when he became an executive uh, at Lafayette Clinic and he was working in the, in, the, in the very place where he had gotten treatment. After I completed the program and uh, got off the drug completely, group therapy was on, on a Sunday 
at the Lafayette Clinic where I used to work, where I was, had been working. Although I had completed the program and got signed off as, you know, done, D-O-N-E, finish, I would go by, go by Sundays and be, a, take part in the, in the group therapies. And the guys, the other nine guys just didn't understand why would I keep coming around them if, uh, if I was finished. But I said, the reason that I come around you guys, cause I know you, this is a difficult thing to do. And if you can see, I'm not any smarter than you, either one of you nine guys. And if I can do it, you know, you, you should be able to do it. And if you see me and see what I've accomplished, you know, you, you may just, as you know, desire to, you know, keep going. Everybody has different skills and different tools that they can pull together for themselves, you know, to help them do that. I mean, it's hard for somebody to inspire them, but they still have to do it themselves. And when they do it themselves, it becomes their, they own it. They begin to own that. Yeah, the fact that he would go back, I mean, he could very easily have just parlayed his athletic and just, but the fact that he would go back and complete his education and uh, get a doctorate and do all of this non-athletic work. When I came home in 92, I didn't know which way to go, but I had some friends still. Kind helped me when I was down with that program. And you know, he gave me a job. You know what I'm saying? I worked, I worked and I tried to do the best I could to help him. Now back on his feet and sober, Klein sought to right some of the wrongs of his past, volunteering for charity and community outreach, using his story as inspiration for others to find a path to sobriety. All the while, he longed to shine a light on his forgotten teammates whose memory had been eclipsed by the growth of the National Basketball Association, who was writing its own storied history with names like Magic Johnson, Larry Bird, and Michael Jordan, while at the same time denying pensions to players for the Globetrotters and other teams that were on the card with the NBA to keep fans in the seats. They needed both an advocate and a historian. More than 60 years ago, a man named John Klein earned his nickname as Jumpin' Johnny with the famous Harlem Globetrotters as he traveled the U.S. and the world. Today, he continues to travel to recognize the pioneers in the game of basketball. I'm here to talk about the, uh, a little bit about the history of the Harlem Globetrotters and basketball, which is my favorite, one of my favorite subjects. He may not stand as tall as he used to, but the platform he stands on towers with pride. As founder of the Black Legends of Professional Basketball, Klein has devoted a lot of his time to recognizing the amazing athletes that have helped transform the game of basketball. The, the sport of basketball expanded my life and gave me a broader perspective. I wanted to give something back to the game of basketball and also to the players, particularly those pioneers who played in the early days. The Basketball Legends Professional Foundation is here to recognize and to assist under Dr. John Klein's leadership that men be inducted into the Michigan Sports Hall of Fame as Dr. Klein has done. He was, he's very, very big on the history of black basketball. And the fact that people, the many, many people and many young people, they don't know who the New York men's were. They don't know that the Harlem Globetrotters actually used to be a very competitive, in the, in the true sense of competitive. They used to actually play uh, against the top white teams of the, of the era. Klein had some great ideas, man. And the guys up in New York, when, he, when they came in, see, he had about 800 people at the affair, the first affair he gave down to Kobo. Welcome you this evening to the uh, second annual gathering of Legends Dinner Award Ceremony. And I appreciate you for joining us in honoring these pioneers and legendary professional basketball players. We had so many people I mean, guys I hadn't seen in years. Salisbury was living there. I think Tex was here, Marcus Haynes, Lemon was here. My roommate, Joe Buckhall, my friend, best, one of my best friends, Carl Green. 
kind. He got all these guys back coming his way. Number one was to honor those players who had made that, those significant contributions to the game of professional basketball and to provide any kind of assistance and help to them that we can, those who needed it. With the NBA still denying pensions, Dr. Klein sought representation for his teammates in the hollowed halls of the Naismith Basketball Hall of Fame. He didn't seek it for himself, but went to the world's greatest dribbler, Marcus Haynes, who would help bring them into the national spotlight. Uh, I didn't know that Dr. Klein was instrumental in helping him get into the Hall of Fame. I called Marcus and said, Marcus, we want to we want to run you. We want you to be our candidate for this, this major breakthrough because we don't have a Harlem Globetrotter in, in the Hall of Fame as a player. And this would open, we believe, would open the door for future possibilities for players. And he is welcome to the Hall of Fame and presented with his ring by Hall of Famer John McClendon. Let me tell you just how I got here. There's a recently founded foundation called the Black Legends of Basketball Foundation. Johnny Klein is the one who started this group, the Black Legends of Professional Basketball. Johnny Klein and the Black Legends. What he was doing with that organization was uh, making sure that the accurate history was being told and uh, trying to spotlight some of the great players that either had been forgotten about or uh, people don't, didn't even know who they were. Following Marcus Haynes' induction in 1998, the Harlem Globetrotters would join the Naismith Hall of Fame as a team in 2002. The following year would see the doors swing open for Meadowlark Lemon, followed by the Globetrotters' first female squad member, Lynette Woodard, and then Goose Tatum in 2011. Before Dr. Klein's work, the only Globetrotters who had entered the hall were the team's founder, Abe Saperstein, and Wilt Chamberlain, who did so on the merits of his 72 NBA records that still stand to this day. For his grassroots efforts, the Naismith Hall of Fame named Dr. John Klein the 2011 recipient of the Manny Jackson Award. Recently, Dr. Klein was listed as a nominee for the 2019 Hall of Fame class in the contributors category. Prior to this, Dr. Klein was inducted into the African American Sports Hall of Fame, the Wayne State University Sports Hall of Fame in Detroit in 2004, and the Michigan Sports Hall of Fame in 2005. These are among the countless awards and honors bestowed upon him. We all grew up to love, respect, and honor him. And we didn't even know all that, but even when we found out, it, it, made, it just made us even more proud of him. All the major ceremonies, you know, going to uh, when the Globe Charters uh, gave him an award for his humanitarian works and the championship ring. And Ladies and gentlemen, please direct your attention to center court for a very special presentation. Joining the Harlem Globetrotters and head coach Clyde Sinclair, along with Sweet Lou Dunbar, is Dr. John Klein, a man who defines everything the Globetrotters strive to be. We would like to present Dr. Klein with the prestigious Harlem Globetrotters Legend Award. This award was created in 1993 as a way to recognize those who have made a contribution to the community outside of basketball and played a role in the development of the Globetrotters brand. Dr. Klein, who is known to friends and fans alike as Jumpin' Johnny, Thank you very much. I'd like to thank Mr. Manny Jackson and the Harlem Globetrotter family for this prestigious award. I'd also like to thank the uh, selection committee, the alumni who, who chose me uh, as a recipient of this award. And I'd be remiss if I did not thank the black legends, the pioneers of professional basketball who played with the Globetrotters back in the 20s, the 30s, the 40s, and 50s before integration into the league. Uh, I, I'm very grateful, we all should be grateful to those particular pioneers of professional basketball. And uh, furthermore, and finally, I'd like to say thanks to the Harlem Globetrotters for the opportunity I've had to experience such a wonderful part of my life that I'll never forget. Long live the Globetrotters, long live sweet Georgia Brown. Right. Thank you very much.
Once again, ladies and gentlemen, that's Legends Award recipient, Mr. Dr. John Klein. My dad was able to um, have all this talent and become world famous, you know, as, as a globetrotter during the time when they really traveled the world. But once you're a globetrotter, you're always a globetrotter. And I used the basketball as a vehicle of telling them, you know, this is what's interesting, but look where it can take you. This basketball has taken me all over the world. This basketball has given me an education that I probably wouldn't have got if I had to chose another career. To be able to take that same drive that he applied to that, once he was able to lift himself up from, uh, from the drug addiction, and well, it actually put that drive into fueling himself to, to become cured of the drug addiction and then take that same drive and put it into and giving back to the community and developing and being able to accomplish so many things. He wants to stress uh, the medical things and, and uh, the importance of education and uh, helping people get over addiction. I mean, all, all of these things he views as way more significant than the fact that he was a member of the Globetrotters. All the different programs that he became involved in, the basketball camps with the kids, the drug program at Lafayette, the outreach programs um, in the neighborhoods, helping uh, uh, with food programs. And he, was, he worked for the uh, mayor of um, Detroit, and he also um, did some work for the governor. And uh, then he started working in the school systems. The Skill and Foundation gave him 700000 you know, for three years. But he had everything. Like he had to have a staff. He had a car. You know, it was a hell of a program, crime. Johnny Klein is most proud of the things he did in his post-athletic career. I've been blessed that every day I'm around some of the best people that you can find in the world. Johnny was one of those kind of folk too. The thing that I find about people like him, and I want the world to know this, there are so many good people in the world who want to do good. No matter where their pasts have been, they've all come with their stories. I would describe him as a dedicated, caring human being who, when he sees something wrong, wants to right it. He is constantly trying to figure out ways to make life better for people. He was a, a gracious man. And it's always an honor to meet those that came before me that helped lay the, the foundation for me to be able to do what I'm doing. So I was very gracious for Dr. Klein and this humility of being able to share his story. He, to me, he's a very inspirational uh, figure and uh, a great motivator. And he's got something in him that, uh, and, and he cares a lot. I mean, there's a compassionate side, and, and, but there, there is a tough side because you don't become a uh, top professional athlete if you don't have that competitive uh, fire in you. But he's somebody that cares about, he cares about the world and cares about people. And it was much more important to him to make a contribution off the basketball court than on the basketball court. This man was a man that had so many highs and so many lows, but he was able to overcome all of those things. So it tells you how, how strong the mind is and how strong the individual was. I think it's really fitting that Dr. Klein found his way to the Globetrotters because if you look at Dr. Klein's mission later in life, he, he tried to spread uh, good cheer and, and help people. He saw the world, he saw society, he saw a need, and he committed himself to addressing that need. And you know, a regular guy, you know, who wants to, well, he wasn't real regular because he wanted to eat some sushi. And I don't think regular people eat sushi, okay? Yeah. When you have a person like my dad who has come from so high up and dropped down like that, then I think it, it helps the fact that the average person walking the street, the child or the teenager that gets hooked on drugs and they out there and 
you know, laying in the gutter and people are walking over them to, to maybe think, this is, this is, a, this, look at what happened with him with just some support and, and, you know, people being there for him and him being able to lift himself up and come back and be uh, such a great example, not only that, but to give so much back. Even though Johnny Klein is really a superstar, he was just the regular down home boy, except for eating the sushi. Some hot water cornbread would have been a lot better, but I think it was from Detroit, so they probably didn't have that up there. Johnny, if you ever hear me, I'm gonna let you know, man, you need some neck bones. He's never gonna stop going. My dad is 87 years old, and from now until the time comes, he's gonna still be doing whatever he feels he can do to make this world a better place. On July 16, 2018, six months after our initial interview, Dr. John Klein passed away, surrounded by family and friends. He left behind 12 children, 22 grandchildren, and 28 great-grandchildren. Though remembered as one of the barnstorming era's finest rebounders, his enduring legacy remains. The countless number of people whose lives he touched and were saved from the disease of addiction. John, how would you like to be remembered? <laughs> remembered? Who's going to remember me? <laughs> what defines you? My mission in life, as far back as I can remember, is has been to be a, a good servant. If people remember me, those who remember me for being uh, patient and compassionate and understanding and, and caring and trying to make the world a better place, you know, that I found it, than what it was when I found it, then that's what I, how I would like to be remembered. Not because I was one of the greatest basketball players that ever lived, which I was, but because I, I saw the world in need of a little more compassion, a little more understanding, a little more freedom, and I tried my best to add something to bringing that about. And that's it. Good.